The Philippines now is a major exporter of coconut oil and other products such as copra meal. For a country that was once the world's biggest coconut producer, it hurts a little to know that we are no longer on but top. It's been called the tree of life. Coconut contributes nearly 4% of the country's gross value added in agriculture. Coconuts is going to make us millions of dollars. That's what I thought when I first saw the supply of coconuts in the Philippines. And thinking to myself, man, I pay a lot of money in the USA for some of this. I can really get some from the Philippines, sell it in the US, make tons of money, and help lots and lots of people with the money I make. Most coconuts consumed in North America are imported from tropical countries. The number one being the Philippines. Second is Indonesia, then Mexico, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Thailand, India. But Philippines is the number one exporter of coconuts to the U.S. I mean, like a lot. Like in 2023, it was over $600 million worth of coconut and coconut products. And personally, I think it's going to continue to grow. And actually, the CAGR, Compound Annual Growth Rate, shows that it's been growing since 2018 at a 6.5% rate. And coconut water is one of the fastest growing segments, reaching close to a billion dollars in 2023. So naturally, me being a businessman, I'm just looking at supply and demand. I'm seeing coconuts sitting on the ground while I visit the Philippines, rotting away. And I'm still thinking to myself, what can we do and utilize in this community that has this beautiful asset of coconuts to really support the local economy and local jobs and local people and heck even my wife's family that lives here in the Philippines. So from a young age I always worked in business. I actually didn't go to college, pretty much dropped out of high school, finished school at an adult school early to get my diploma and went off to do business. Worked at my aunt's donut shop, did certain things, ended up getting my own donut shop. From there, getting into real estate, construction, clothing business. I mean, you name it, I've done a lot of it. Pretty much a serial entrepreneur. But the biggest part was where God took me from depending on myself and my skills and showed me that there was more. And that actually, those skills could be used in a bigger and better way. And I got into social enterprise, working with nonprofits, raising money, creating small businesses that really generated revenue to help the cause of the nonprofit. And went back into the real estate world, working with the community, and did very well for myself. But there still was something more, something that just drew me to coconuts. A calling, you can say. Something that made me give up a beautiful life and success, career, business, establishment, house, cars, to move halfway around the world to a third world country to develop coconuts. And boy, did I think that was a mistake six months into it. Having visited my wife's family a couple times in the Philippines, I did some more research. I went to go visit the PCA, which is the Filipino Coconut Authority, and by God's grace, I met the president of the Bohol chapter of the PCA. I met Uncle Romero in 2019, and that was when Cheryl and I were like, all right, there's something with coconuts. So we went to the leading authority in coconuts, which was the PCA. And so Romero has been, was the president, he is now retired. 27 years with the PCA as regional manager, as president, okay. provincial manager, and then uh, president First of the Coconut, uh, Coconut Farmers Association. So just a wealth of knowledge, it's been a blessing to us. And he's actually shaped a lot of ideas of where the pursuit of coconuts is going. So we just want to thank you. He was enthusiastic, passionate, and loved the idea of creating a manufacturing company that would focus on developing coconuts for export and also working with the community to give back to the hard-working farmers in the industry. I spent the next six months with the farmers, with the locals, with the people, creating an asset-based community development research that went down to the details and also learned so much more than I anticipated. Sir Romero was a great asset. He is now retired, but still has a passion for farming and his people. He was able to introduce me to different manufacturers on different islands, taught me a lot about coconuts, how to even boil it down, getting the nectar and turning it into sugar myself. We spent endless hours talking about the people here and how they can benefit. 
what their mentalities are, their weaknesses, their pain points, the strength in his people, the love that they have for one another, and the opportunity that he saw himself. And boy, did I fall in love, not only with his heart, with his vision, but with the passion that he had around coconuts and his people. I can say we've built a relationship and friendship over the passion of coconuts. Mr. Romero introduced me to a few key people and some players in the coconut industry. These business leads were gold. I was able to meet and also get introduced to a lot of the managers and operators. This was perfect because what I did not mention was that a couple of our family members, aunts, cousins, actually own close to 30 hectares, that is about 60 acres of coconut farms. For them, it was not so much about the money, but the fact that the PCA introduced programs that they would be able to get funds by planting trees. They found this as an opportunity to create jobs, hire locals, and create a farm that would then produce continual work for the locals that they had passion for. Now this is totally backwards and probably the reason why the success of coconuts isn't what it could be here on this island. They were incentivized to plant coconuts knowing that there's a big industry, but they didn't teach or create the industry to take those coconuts away from where they're planted to the demand around the world. So that meant lots of supply and no outlet to sell it, which crashed the coconut supply and industry here in the Philippines. And what I mean by supply is they just decided not to pick the coconuts. They could not even pay the farmers enough money and the pickers to pick the coconuts because they would not have a place to sell it. Not here, locally at least. So back to the businesses that we went to go visit, there was three that really stood out to me. The largest was the La Mac Multipurpose Cooperative. They created a coconut hub in Cebu that was to serve 1,500 farmers in an area of about 50 or 60 hectares, meaning about 120 acres. This coconut hub was set to produce 10,000 coconuts a day. That's a lot of labor, that's a lot of jobs, and that's a lot of coconuts that would then benefit the farmers who are farming vast areas of fields. They also had fiber nets that they created by weaving together coconut fibers into these long braids and then netted it together and then they would use that for landscaping and also large builds to make sure roads and sides of hills were not eroding away. Now a big contrast in production was the Lobok and Corellia, which is on a smaller island called Bohol, which is where I'm at. Both of these also cooperatives. Now these two cooperatives are a bit smaller. They do have plants of scale, but their main focus is VCO, virgin coconut oil. Some of the byproducts, like the shavings of the coconut, is used for fertilizers or composting, and the shells are then sold to another organization that then creates coconut charcoal. So all of this nut is used up in different forms to make sure that there is no waste at the end. What I realized is that each production was heavily subsidized by the government or the PCA and also that they were not working at their full capacity. Frankly, there was just not enough sales. And I think part of that is just because they were focusing on a local market. There is a high supply and a low demand, which created a low price and probably a saturation of coconuts here creates a very difficult time to figure out how to sell this raw good locally here. Farmers worked three to five years just to start even producing any of the fruit, and now they don't even have a way to export or sell their supply. Now there lies the opportunity. We really have to figure out ways to process and ship out. Now those connections are very hard just because a lot of people don't have the opportunity to go look for those connections, build those connections, and also the upfront investment just to be able to stock, sell, ship, and satisfy the needs of those that are overseas that might have specific requirements for their oils. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but a lot of those companies are private and they definitely want to make as much money as possible, whereas these cooperatives are looking out for the best interests of the locals and the farmers. So there has to be a better way of doing this. So I had to figure things out. I mean, this is the fruit of life, they call it. And as hopeful as I can be, and with all the prayers that I've had, I wanted to really start a coconut manufacturing that would 
do everything that I dreamed of, but it was just too big at the moment. And God just said, not now, which I wanted to be in the agriculture world. I wanted to relate to the farmers and walk in their shoes. So what better way than to start a farm, but just not a regular one, but an aquaponic one to be able to bring new technology, build a lab, start formulating things and creating ideas, start training, making connection with the other farmers. And that way we both can all benefit. And instead of competing with the coconut farmers, we brought another element to help with farming, different connections, different resources, and different mindsets to the whole world of agriculture. So what does that mean? Well, we've got an aquaponic farm that we're now training other farmers, finding out ways to make it affordable to the locals, testing things out, having R&D. We've also formulated some formulas with coconut products, and we're excited to see how that's going to turn out. We're going to have a set of candles, soaps, and virgin coconut oil that are processed a special way that's going to be super healthy. And we're going to introduce that to the market in the USA by the end of the year. Now, profits from that will go back to serve the farmers and also expand the operation. We've got impact investors, we've got an audience, we've got our YouTube channel, and we've got a lot of you guys that have supported. So if you haven't yet, please hit the like, please hit the subscribe. All that actually helps our mission. And you know what? I got to tell you, the truth of it all is that God had a bigger vision beyond me, that the thoughts that I had the ideas that I wanted to execute were all of my own. And once I let God work, he opened the doors to a lot more opportunities, a lot more connections and a lot more frustration because I had to learn, I had to be humbled and I have to walk in faith every day. So if you're following us, we thank you. We're excited to see what's to come. We pray that you would support all of our endeavors and that we would fight corporate greed, corruption, food insecurity, and support the farmers here and all around the world. So thank you for watching this far on The Pursuit of Coconuts, and we'll see you on the next episode as we continue this journey. Love and peace. Peace.